There's nothing worse than a bad breakup, and throughout the history of the NHL, we've seen several. As a fan, it's always hard watching a top talent on your team make an abrupt exit, leaving us all wondering what in the world is going on behind closed doors. Some of these NHL breakups got pretty messy, so in this video, we're going to dive in and take a look at the top 6 worst breakups in NHL history. Danny Heatley and the Ottawa Senators after four productive seasons in Ottawa, during which he scored 50 goals twice, Heatley had established himself as one of the game's most prolific wingers. However, the team was struggling and had missed the playoffs for the first time in 13 years. Additionally, Heatley had clashed with newly appointed coach Corey Clouston. Heatley expressed his desire to leave the team primarily due to his apparent dislike for Clouston. He made it clear that he had no intention of playing another game in Ottawa and intended to exercise his no-trade clause to ensure a transfer to a team of his preference. The Senators were reluctant to accommodate Heatley's demand of choosing his destination. Initially, they reached an agreement with the Edmonton Oilers only for Heatley to utilize his no-trade clause and reject the deal. To make matters worse, the situation dragged on for an extended period, resulting in the team having to pay Heatley a $4 million roster bonus. Eventually, the Senators granted Heatley's request and traded him to the San Jose Sharks in exchange for Milan McCulloch and other assets, a deal widely perceived as heavily favoring the Sharks. Sharks. The Senators resorted to legal proceedings in an attempt to recover the bonus money. Patrick Waugh and the Montreal Canadiens Patrick Waugh had been a pivotal figure in Montreal, leading the team to two Stanley Cup victories, earning three Vezina trophies, and solidifying his status as the widely regarded best goalie in hockey. However, tensions arose between Waugh and newly appointed coach Mario Tremblay with rumors circulating about possible physical confrontations. The breaking point came during a game against the Red Wings in December of 1995. In that infamous matchup, the Canadians suffered a devastating 11-1 loss and Tremblay left Waugh in the net for 9 of those goals before finally replacing him. Feeling deeply humiliated and mistreated, Waugh approached the bench, bypassed Tremblay, and expressed to team president Ronald Corey that he would never play another game for the Montreal Canadiens. Tremblay attempted to downplay the situation, stating, if there's any problem, we're going to solve it tomorrow. However, no resolution was reached. The team subsequently suspended Patrick Waugh, and just four days later, he was traded to the Colorado Avalanche. Waugh's arrival to Colorado proved immensely successful as he led the team to their first Stanley Cup victory that same year, followed by another Cup victory in 2001. As for the Montreal Canadiens, they faced significant criticism for not securing substantial compensation in exchange for the future Hall of Famer. Eric Lindros and the Philadelphia Flyers the dynamic between Lindros and the Flyers had always appeared strained, but there were notable highlights such as his Hart Trophy win in 1995 and a journey to the Stanley Cup Final in 1997. However, as the year 2000 approached, Lindros faced multiple concussions and other health issues. His courageous attempt to return during the conference finals was abruptly halted by Scott Stevens marking Lindros' final game as a Flyer. Refusing the Flyers' two-way qualifying offer, Lindros informed GM Bobby Clark of his desire to be traded, setting the condition that he would only accept a move to the Toronto Maple Leafs. Lindros made it clear that if the deal couldn't be reached, he would sit out the entire season until he was traded. While the Flyers were open to trading Lindros, they stood firm on not settling for a discounted deal. Despite nearing a trade with Toronto on several occasions, the two sides failed to finalize an agreement. GM Clark was ready to let Lindros miss the entire year if fair value couldn't be obtained. True to his word, Lindros sat out the entire 2000-2001 season. After coming close to a deal with the Leafs, he eventually relented and provided Clark with an expanded list of potential destinations. Clark managed to strike a deal with the New York Rangers, finally bringing an end to the prolonged saga. In retrospect, the Flyers didn't receive substantial returns for their once prominent franchise player. Although Lindros did maintain reasonable productivity in his initial season with the Rangers, he never recaptured his dominant form. Daryl Sittler and the Toronto Maple Leafs Sittler, arguably the greatest Maple Leaf of all time, also served as a captain for six seasons. However, in 1979, Sittler removed the C from his jersey following a dispute with management. He later reclaimed the captaincy, but in 1981, his relationship with the front office had gotten so bad, he requested for a trade. 
Although several teams expressed interest, it took the Leafs nearly two months to finalize a deal. In January of 1982, Sittler decided to step away from the team, citing doctor's orders for a necessary hockey hiatus. Two weeks later, the Leafs finally executed a trade, sending Sittler to the Flyers. At this stage in his career, Sittler was past his prime, but he performed well for the Flyers. Meanwhile, the Maple Leafs appeared highly disorganized throughout the entire ordeal, reinforcing their reputation as the league's laughingstock during that Harold Ballard era. Paul Correa and the Mighty Ducks Correa, the inaugural draft pick in Mighty Ducks history, became the face of the franchise during his nearly decade-long tenure in Anaheim. In 2003, he led the team to an impressive playoff run that fell just one victory short of capturing the Stanley Cup. Korea's salary for the year amounted to a substantial $10 million, and as the season concluded, the Ducks were obligated to extend him a qualifying offer of the same amount. However, they decided not to do so, and Korea was upset. Ducks GM Brian Murray felt he couldn't allocate a quarter of the team's approximate $40 million payroll to a single player. Despite some temporary sourness, it was widely anticipated that Korea would ultimately rejoin Anaheim on a long-term contract with a slightly reduced annual salary. But to surprise the hockey world, Korea shocked everyone by signing with the Colorado Avalanche for a shocking $1.2 million. This decision aimed to reunite him with the close friend and fellow free agent Timu Solani, further improving an already offensively potent Avalanche squad and making them a clear favorite for a Stanley Cup run. However, the Avalanche fell short of winning that cup and the following season was wiped out due to a lockout. Korea went on to play five more split seasons between Nashville and St. Louis. Unfortunately, injuries plagued Korea's career, preventing him from reclaiming his superstar status. Meanwhile, the Ducks, without Paul Korea, missed the playoffs in 2004, but swiftly rebuilt their team and ultimately clinched the Stanley Cup in 2007. Bobby Hall and the Chicago Blackhawks Bobby Hall had an illustrious 15-year tenure with the Blackhawks, solidifying his status as one of the most prolific goal scorers in NHL history. He dominated the league, leading in goals seven times and even setting a single-season record. By 1972, his 604 career goals surpassed all other active NHL players. When the World Hockey Association, the WHA, emerged on the scene that year, speculation arose that possible NHL stars may be enticed to join this new league. Bobby Hall hinted that it would require a substantial sum to lure him away from the NHL. To the astonishment of the hockey world, the Winnipeg Jets presented him with an offer that met his demands and he signed a groundbreaking 10-year contract. His move to the WHA prompted other players to follow suit. The NHL then sought legal intervention, attempting to prevent players from leaving, and the Blackhawks obtained a restraining order against Hall. However, in November of 1972, the court ruled against the NHL, granting Hall the freedom to join the WHA. He continued his remarkable goal-scoring prowess, netting 50 or more goals in each of his first four seasons in the league, including an extraordinary 77 goals in 1975. While Bobby Hall's decision to join the WHA brought the league some much-needed credibility, it ultimately only lasted until 1979. Nevertheless, the NHL's authority over players was significantly weakened, paving the way for an eventual surge in player salaries. Thanks for watching our videos. Don't forget to leave a like, and if you're new to the channel, hit that subscribe button.